The desire of Titus Women is to invite women around the world to know Jesus as their Savior, Center, and Source. May God guide and encourage you through this message by Beth Coppage. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from the Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel. And they lodged there before they crossed over. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests and the leaders bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits my measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Then Joshua spoke to the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the, t- the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of Israel. They they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And you shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water, you shall stand in the Jordan. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hevites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Now therefore take for yourselves twelve men from the tribe of Israel, one from each tribe. Uh, And it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off and the waters that came down from upstream, and they shall stand in a heap. And let's go down to 15. And as those who bore the ark came to the Jordan and the feet of the priests who bore the ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the water of Jordan overflows its banks during the whole time of harvest, that the waters which came from the up, upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zeraton. So the waters that went down into the sea and the Arabah, the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people crossed over opposite Jordan. Then the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood there on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel passed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. And let's read a couple verses in the next chapter. And it came to pass when they had completely passed over that the Lord spoke to Joshua, Take twelve men from your tribe, from the people, one from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones for here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood. You shall carry them over, and you shall leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. And then, if you will go down um, to verse 5, it says, uh, cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst, and each of one you shall take a stone according to the number of the tribes, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, say, what do these stones mean to you? From Then you shall answer them that these waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Verse 9, Joshua set up the twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests who bore the ark of the covenant stood, and they are there to this day. Father, we just pray today you might come. And Father, we just ask that you might come with your Holy Spirit now. And Jesus, thank you that you're here, that you want to come and meet our needs, and we ask that you might. 
pray you might anoint the word by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you might push back any enemy of the, any activity of the enemy, even today, and that, Lord, our thoughts might be quieted and centered on you, and you might say to our hearts today what only you can say. I pray, Father, for your peace in me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And, Father, say to us what you want to say even today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to take this and begin to look at it, just beginning verse by verse. I think there's some tremendous things in this chapter, and I sense a resistance from the enemy for even getting started this morning. So I just pray that the Lord would just come and meet with us in spite of that. So Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from, and came to the Jordan. And it was after three days that the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and the priests bearing it, you shall set out from this place and follow them. So Joshua gets up early in the morning, and they have been waiting for three days before going into the Promised Land. One of the blessings of their waiting was that who was saved in those days that they were waiting. They sent out the spies and waited upon God, and last week we heard that Rahab was saved and all her household. So as they begin now to get, into, get to the Jordan to cross over, you find them instead of just getting up on a morning and just setting off just harem scarum, they wait three more days and they send the people, the, the Joshua's entourage go out and say, prepare yourselves, sanctify yourselves because we're going, the Ark of the Covenant is coming and you are to follow the Ark of the Covenant. And what it meant when they were to sanctify themselves, in this case, it means they were to get clean. They were to wash themselves physically. They were to do everything they could physically to be clean to go into battle. Symbolic of what God wants to do in their hearts spiritually, that before you and I begin to go into battle and possess the promised land and all that God's got for us, we need a deeper cleansing. We need God to do on the inside what only he can do. But they were to do on the outside. They were abstained from sexual relations for those three days. They were to get cleaned up physically, and they were to get ready to follow the Ark of the Covenant. Now, what is the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark was a rectangular box covered with gold. Two cherubim were over it, and it was symbolic of the presence of God, the most important possession that was in the Israelites' camp. It was symbolic of God's presence and power. Inside the ark were three things. A jar of manna, God's provision for the Israelites' daily food for 40 years while they tromped around the desert. The second thing is the rod that was the symbol of his protection 40 years in the desert. The third thing was the, were the Ten Commandments, the symbol of his word where God revealed himself to his people. So that those were the three things symbolic of God's presence and his longing to be involved with his people. So as the Ark of the Covenant went before the people, they were not to go and all just clamor around it. There was a sense of awe. So they were to follow behind it, but they were to go forward and follow the Ark of the Presence of God. So that's what just what happens. The people get themselves ready, and then the ark goes. Now, God fights his battles in unusual ways. He doesn't send in the troops first. Who does he send in? He sends in the ark of his presence, and then he sends in the preachers. Because what he's doing is he's going into spiritual warfare, not only on a physical realm. The people here that lived here, the judgment of God had come upon them. because, And it said, he, God prophesied it way, he told Moses, he said, 400 years your children will be in captivity. Then they'll be let, set free from Egypt. Then they will wander for 40 years. And then I will let them go into the promised land. Because by that time, the fullness of the Amorite sin will have come together. And it will be time for the judgment of God. And you and I are foolish if we believe that we can go so long and sin against God and sin against God and sin against God and that ultimately the judgment of God will not come. And as a society, we are foolish. 
And the same things that God's judgment came upon the Canaanites for, these seven tribes, these seven um, different national groups that were in the Palestinian land, the same sins that he judged them for, as you and I look at what they were judged for, these are the current today in our culture, homosexuality, uh, um, um, sodomy, pornography, violence, abortion. They used to have orgies where they burn and sacrifice babies and children and then have sexual orgies in front of them. That's what it meant to worship Baal. And God said, the judgment has come upon them. I will not stand for that any longer. And God is saying that to us as a people today. He said, you and I are in spiritual warfare and we are going to affect a nation for God. And the only way we can affect a nation for God is you and I get prepared spiritually. And there comes into our lives a willingness to follow the ark of of the covenant of God wherever he leads. Remember the end of the first chapter? What did the Jews tell Joshua? They said, all that you say to us, we will do. And the second thing, wherever you send us, we will go. And God is taking them up at that. At, they promised that. And what has he done? He is bringing them to a raging Jordan River and said, are you willing to put your feet where your mouth is? And do you know some of you are in that same spot today? Because you've had to put your feet where your mouth was. Oh, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I do love Jesus. And then Jesus said, arise and go to Wilmore. Sell all and follow me. And you say, oh, do I love you that much, Jesus? And then you've gotten here. And you've said, Lord, there should be something really special for me here because of my willingness to come. But this does not look like it's special. Do you know what Amy Carmichael said? She said, sometimes God's choicest presents come in lumpy brown parcels. And that's not what we want. What we want is a Christmas present, all wrapped like they do at McAlpin's, big bow and beautiful paper, and say, oh, I'll receive that from you, Jesus. But when it comes in a lumpy brown parcel, we say, this was not in my job description. This is not what I intended. And Lord, I do not think I want this. But if you have begun to walk with God over and over again, do you know what you'll see? That those lumpy brown parcels that you cannot understand why God's brought them into your life at this point in time, if you will embrace Jesus in this in that midst of that lumpy brown parcel, you will find there is a sweetness there and there is a sense of his presence. And when you come through the trial or temptation or tribulation, you will know him in ways you would have never known him if he had given you a Christmas present wrapped in McAlpin's wrap. So what does he do? He leads the people of God down to the Jordan River. Now, God could have led, it, led them down there when it was, it was during the drought. And it would be smaller, and they could have marched over. But God didn't see fit to do that, because you know what God was trying to do? He was letting them face an absolutely impossible situation. It was at flood tide, and the waters roared through the Jordan. And there was no way that they could get across that Jordan until they waited till it was drought. And God said, I've called you to go over to that western bank and conquer that land and I want you to follow the ark of my presence. And when the priest dip their feet into that water, it will part and you can go over on dry ground. So they got all marched to an, already, two and a half million people following the ark of the covenant. And they got within a hundred yards of the Jordan River. But still a raging torrent. They got within 50 yards of the Jordan River. Still a raging torrent. Got within 25 yards, still a raging torrent. And then they thought, oh my Jesus, are you sure we want to cross here? And what was happening at that point? Got to within 20 yards. Lord, you know, we may not live if we go in that. Well, you've got to trust me. Well, Lord, Lord, you, Lord isn't there some other way? Couldn't we just wait? No, just trust me, and you're not quite there yet. I said if you get there and put your feet in the water, it'd part. Lord, isn't there any other easier way? Because we might die. And he said, you might die, but are you willing to trust me that I can take care of you and that I will do what I promised to do to bring you to the other side? 
do you know, Lord, that's an awfully big river, and those waves are very high. And you know, I've got these five little children, and you know, you wouldn't want to, you know, Lord, do you know what you're doing, Jesus? Have you ever said that to him? I have. <laughs> do you know what you're doing? It's absolutely impossible, God, and I don't want to go through that. And maybe it's a surgery like Holly's facing. Maybe it's it's what to do about your your career that you've had to put on hold. Maybe it's what to do about your finances. Maybe it's what to do with a difficult child or difficult marriage or difficult situation. And you said, Lord, I am bankrupt. It's utterly impossible. And he said, will you follow me through that river? And do you know what that river is symbolic of? That river is symbolic of you and I coming to grips with the eternal God and saying, Yes, God, I will follow you even if I die. And coming to grips to say yes, 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 yes. No matter what it costs, no matter what it takes, I will go through the river. And do you know what you leave on the one side? You live your life of self-effort. And when you get to that point, you say, yes, I will abandon everything and go through the river in the name of Jesus Christ. And if I perish, I perish. You will go up on the other side of the river and you will be cleansed and sanctified, holy hook, line, and sinker. And do you know what God is looking for? He's looking for women who will have the courage to say yes to an eternal God. And the reason we don't say yes is we do not believe God is good. We don't trust him. We're afraid of him. And we think, I alone am able to take care of my life. My husband can't do it. No one else. I've got to look out for number one. And we spiritualize it, but the bottom dollar is still, I need to be in control. I will cover it with all kinds of spiritual gibberish, but I need to be in control, and I will not surrender my will. And we surrender it at different levels, but when we get right down to putting our feet in that Jordan and walking across, following nothing more than the ark of the presence of God, out of obedience to him, it is terrifying. I read this week, one of the commentaries I'm using for Joshua is by F.B. Meyer. And F.B. Meyer was a terrific preacher in England. And it was about 100 years ago, and he was a very good preacher. But one day he went to hear seven men that, the, that history is called the Cambridge Seven that were called to China as missionaries. And they were not just average people in the English um, society of 100 years ago. They had all been to Eton and Cambridge, and they were all at Cambridge University, and they were from the blue bloods of England. In fact, one of the men was C.T. Studd, who was the most famous sportsman in all of England, like O.J. Simpson without the criminal record, <laughs> and so or the criminal release. <laughs> but, with, but he was, everybody in England knew C.T. Studd. He was a very wealthy man. He gave away all his fortune, and then he said, I'm called to China, and he went out with these seven other blue bloods to China. Before, and this, the whole nation was in shock. Well, before he left, he spoke one night, and F.B. Meyer, this fine preacher, went to hear him. And he said he couldn't remember so much as what he said as what he sensed in his life, what he, that here was a man who was entirely abandoned to Jesus Christ. He had held nothing back. It was all God's. So after a word, he went up to him, and he said, what you said really moved me. And he said, I'm just wondering. I think I need something new in my life. And C.T. Studd was very blunt, and he looked him straight in the eye, and he said, Have you surrendered to Jesus Christ 100%? And he was a preacher. So he looked right back at him and said, Oh, yes, I have. And the Holy Spirit of God talked to F.B. Meyer, and he said, Oh, no, you haven't. <laughs> and he went home, and he left that man shaken. And he went home and knelt down by his bed, and he said, God, and God said, F.B. Meyer, you have no more surrendered every key of your life to me than the man in the moon. He said, I want every key in your life. Every one. And then F.B. Meyer said, okay, Lord, okay. I'm a preacher. That's what you're supposed to do if you're in full-time Christian service. I'll give you every key. So he handed over the key ring. And then the Lord began to count the keys. And he counted and he said, F.B. Meyer, 
there's one missing. And he said, Lord, it's just a little key. Can I just have that little key? And the Lord said, it's not so little. <laughs> he said, it's not so little, F.B. Meyer. It'll be your destruction. What you don't let me have in the cross will be your doom and destruction. Because you need all of me. You need not to have one place where Satan can get a loophole in your life. And the thing you and I hold on and coddle in our hearts in 15, 20 years will be the thing that will damn your soul and damn your children. You say, oh, I don't want to just surrender in that area of my life. A little bit of lust is all right. If I'd only married so-and-so, you don't know what a difficult husband I have. God says, no, you've got to surrender every part of your life. You can't hold on to it because it feeds in your soul and it will destroy you and destroy those children you love. It will destroy your family and your home. God is not mean. God is saying, give me all of you because you cannot take care of yourself. Only I can take care of you. You are going into a promised land, but you are also going into land where there are forces of evil at work that seek to damn and destroy. And we we only fool ourselves if we think any other way. And so FBI Meyer knelt there that day and he said, Lord, I give you the last key. I give you all of me for all of you. And do you know what? He went from being a fine preacher to being a great preacher of the gospel. And I'm reading his, reading his commentaries to get ready because there came a day when he let the Holy Spirit have all of his life and the power and impact of that still touches people today, such as myself. I read another story where a man was wrestling with a call to really surrender everything to the Lord and he was under such conviction that he was a preacher as well. He actually fell down the stairs and he cried up and said, Oh Lord, anything. And the Lord answered back and said, Brown, not anything, it's everything. That's what I want, everything. And do you know that's the crux of the gospel because that is where the cross comes in. We are willing for anything but the cross. Lord, I'll serve you as long as I don't have to come to grips with the cross. But the essence of true Christianity that is radical and changes your life and my life and the world in which we live is when we confront the cross and say, Jesus, I will to die to, so that your life might be raised in my life. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Are you at the Jordan today? Are you tired of the way you're living in your Christian life? Do you long for God to do something more in your life so that there's more consistency, there's more dependability, there's a sense of joy in your relationship to God, that Jesus is your sweetest, dearest, most precious friend? You can have all that. But the secret of it is if you will come to the Jordan and say, Jesus, I am willing to die to the sin and self in my life, and I am willing to let you be God inside me. Are you there? Are you there? That is what Wesley called entire sanctification. When you and I come to the place, that is what it means. You give him all of you for all of him. And we don't want to do it. <laughs> we want to be in control. We want to work for God, but we don't want to really sell out to him. That's why we have so little impact on the world in which we live. Are you willing to go anywhere Jesus sends you? Are you willing to be whatever he wants you to be? Are you willing to do whatever he calls you to do? We go to a camp meeting in Georgia called Indian Springs, and it's 105 years old. And we live in a house that's probably almost 105 years old. <laughs> it is very old, and it has a pointed tin roof, and it has lots of personality. The floor is kind of slant, and it's, it's just not one that would be in better homes and gardens. The home of one of the men who founded this campground and his testimony was one day, his name was W.A. Dodge, and he was a preacher in South Georgia. And one day he came to the place. He said, Jesus, I give you my mind, 
my heart, my soul, my body, my eyes, my hands, my feet, all of me. They found it in his trunk when he died. I give you my wife, Mary, my two children, and he named them. I give you my future, my reputation, all that I have, all that I ever hope to be. I give it to you in the name of Jesus. And he signed and dated it. And then he began, God filled him with his spirit. And he began to preach that Jesus could set you free and let you know and experience the freedom of Jesus in your life. Well, he got together with another preacher, two or three other men. And they said, we need to start something so that we can share what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit and know what it means to be entirely sanctified. So they went to some property 50 miles south of Atlanta and walked around it and began to pray. And it was Christmas, the day before Christmas, and they prayed all over this property. And then God gave them an inner witness that this was the land. And that's how that camp meeting was founded. Do you know what? They didn't have a clue all that God was going to do in that camp meeting. But do you know what? One day, there was a fruit seller going by that camp meeting, going to Florida, and he had a lawyer in the car with him. And the lawyer was a good Methodist, and he saw that camp meeting sign. And he said, leave me here and pick me up on the way back from Florida. And that lawyer found Jesus. And you know, the next summer he came back and he brought his wife and she found Jesus. And the next summer he came back and he brought his two of his five children and they found Jesus. And do you know who that was? That was my grandmama, my granddaddy, and my daddy. Because there was a preacher, what, 50 years before, who said, all of you, Jesus, for all of me. And then he, be, he risked for God. He stepped out and did what only God could do and founded a little camp meeting. And it was out of that camp meeting, the spiritual roots of my father's family were birthed. But you know not only that, there was a dry cleaner in Atlanta who heard about it and he went down and he had been saved but he'd never been filled with the Spirit. He got filled with the Spirit and he said to his wife, we got to bring all our kids down here. They got a cottage and brought all their children. Really count and do you want to know how to really let my life count for God? It means where you and I let go of the keys and let Jesus be Lord of all with nothing held back. What are we holding on to do today? There's nothing worth it because what God wants to do is take all the works of the flesh and replace them with the dynamo of his Holy Spirit so that lives and eternity are different. So that you and I aren't working for God, we're in the stream of the Spirit and God is working through us to do what we can't even fathom to the generations yet to come. That's what he did with Rahab. She said a yes. And God is looking for those of us who are not looking for signs and symbols or lots of emotional experiences, but that we are looking for Jesus himself, like our song said, so that there comes a day where we say, Lord, I want who you are. I want you, Jesus. You alone are the worthy of my love and adoration. Lord, you are the one I long for. And you and I fall irrevocably in love with Jesus Christ. Now, when they got on the other side of the river, God said to them, I want you to take 12 stones from the middle of the river as a symbol of what I have done for you. And when you get to the other side, I want you to put them up as memorial stones that you have died 
and that Jesus is Lord of all in your life. And so they put 12 stones and they made a, a memorial and they said, when your children come, you're to tell them that we were on the other side. There was no way through, but we followed the ark of his presence. God led us through. And all this land that's ours today is because Jesus was faithful and we did not perish. All that was lost in our lives was our sin and self. And he moved us into a wider dimension of himself. And he is setting us free. And God said, I want you to make us a memorial stone there, set it up so that your children will know what I have done for you. And God wants to do so something so dynamic in your life and mine that our children know that we love Jesus, that it's not just a canned faith, but it's real. And so that they know that the deepest passion of your life and mine is Jesus himself. And that there are memorial stones built in our family, in our home, in our lives that they can go to and say, that's where my mama found God. That's where my daddy met God. That's where God worked for our family. That God provided that van. God paid the rent this month. God met us here. God met us there. It was impossible, but look what God has done so that the children get a sense that they're children of the covenant and we have a God who is resurrected, living, and involved in our lives on a daily basis. Are we that kind of mothers? Or have we never sold out to Jesus Christ so that talking about him is hard because he wants to say something to us and we don't want to get close enough to hear what he wants to say? Are we so busy because we don't want to get near enough to him? Because if we get near enough to him, we'd have to really encounter what he's saying to us and we might have to die to that self-will and be resurrected in an, as a new woman in Jesus Christ to make an impact on the world for God. And he doesn't need PhDs and XYDs and MDs. All he needs is one available willing vessel. One available willing vessel. And this morning, I want to pass out a memorial stone. And I want you to do some deep, hard thinking. And I want you to ask Jesus, say, Jesus, where am I? What are you saying to me? Is there any last key in my life that I am holding on to that I need to surrender? And do you need to put down a memorial stone and say, Lord, I am leaving that in Bible study. I am not taking it. I am going home a new woman in Jesus Christ. Never again to pick up, to go back to the old life. And I'm not going to live a life of self-effort. I am going to live a life of victory in Jesus Christ because I have died to my self-will and he is resurrected in my heart and life. I'd like to just close with a story. Do you remember the story of, there was a Christian businessman in England and his name was Cadbury. And he got very concerned about all the drunkenness, especially among the poor people in England. And he asked Jesus for a way to give them something to drink that would not be alcoholic. And he gave him the idea of chocolate, like chocolate milk. So he invented Cadbury's chocolate. This is a true story. He invented Cadbury's chocolate. And so the Lord blessed it because the English loved the chocolate. I like Cadbury's chocolate. So the Lord blessed him, and he, and he had a big plan, and he, and he worked with the people. He had education for the people that worked in his plan. It gave jobs to them. For the mothers that came, he had care for the children. He did visitation. He worked among the, um, the ones that were still on alcohol. He used it to get in the, the lost and the needy and the broken and had a tremendous impact on his part of England. Well, he had a little girl. And, and, her, and so she was, her name was Mary, and she was uh, one of, he had nine children, and so he, she, he had 
Mary was a very precious little girl, and one day she was with him in one of these meetings that was like a rescue mission meeting. And she had known about the Lord all her life, but she had never really sold out to him. He had, she had been saved, but she had never been filled with his spirit. So her daddy was preaching at this rescue mission. And so she went forward with all the drunks and alcoholics that went forward. And her sister was there and said, you don't want to do that. It's just below our station. And she said, station or not, I've just got to let God do something new in my heart. Well, she was just a young, she was just a child. But God took all of Mary and filled her with all of himself. And she became an ardent little soul winner like her father. So she went to school and she took her Bible. And at that time, they mostly had big Bibles. So that's the only, So she took the family Bible and put it on her desk at school to let everybody know. And then she said, if they ask any questions, then I will say it's in the Bible and show it to them. So she began to share with her friends and tell them what Jesus had done in her life. And three or four of the little girls became saved. And then three or four more became. And there began to be a whole bunch of these children that found God all trying to bring their great big Bibles to school. So she said, this is a problem. So she went to her father. He said, they've just come out with something new. And it was a small, like our Gideon New Testament. He said, let me see if I can't get you one of those. Oh, the little girls were elated. And by this time, there were about 60 of them that had found the Lord. So they gave them those little New Testaments. And so she, they said, what will we do with them so we've got them ever ready to use for Jesus? They decided they would sew pockets on all their dresses. So one day, Mary's brother came in, and there were three or four little girls in the room, and they were busy sewing pockets on their dresses so they could slip in their Bibles. And they called it the Pocket Testament League. And they went to school and at a moment's notice had that Bible. All through high school, all through her schooling, God used the Pocket Testament League and brought revival to that whole area. She was an ardent little witness and soul winner. Then she went to college. And when she got to college, she met a beautiful, beautiful English teacher, very sophisticated, very smart, very, and she was just very impressed with her. And she said, Mary, what's that in your pocket? Oh, she said, it's my New Testament. She said, and, and the teacher said, what is your favorite book? And she said, oh, my Bible's my very favorite. And the teacher kind of said, oh. And she said, isn't it your favorite? Because she'd met out and out people in out and out rebellious sin, but she'd never met anybody in sophisticated sin. And she said, don't you believe the Bible? Oh, I believe it's a fine book. And I believe parts of the Bible. Have you heard that before? But I don't believe all of the Bible. I believe it contains parts of the Word of God, but not all the Word of God. And with this sophisticated college professor, Mary began to get just a little more sophisticated and a little more sophisticated and it began to be that her passion for Jesus left because the inerrancy of Scripture took a back seat. And her family and her daddy knew that something had happened in Mary's heart. The passion was gone because she wasn't in the Word the way she'd been. So one day, she came home for Christmas vacation, and the family said, guess what? They were wealthy. So we're going to go on a trip to Israel and the Holy Land for Christmas break. They all packed up all the children and all got over and went and were all so excited. And it was on that trip that her beloved daddy came down with a fever and went to heaven. And Mary went back home and they buried him. 10,000 people came to Mr. Cadbury's funeral. 10,000 people that he led to the Lord. 
And she went back to that college dorm and she said, now which book will I go to? And she thought back to her English professor. Shakespeare didn't do it. None of the sophisticated books did it. She said, oh, my daddy was right. There's one and only one that meets you in the darkest night of the soul. And it's this, the words from his heart to my heart, God's word. And she went back to Jesus in brokenness and humility. And she got, left school and came back and began to work among the poor people that were so on her daddy's heart. And one day, an evangelist came with D.L. Moody, with T Tory, and his song leader, his name was Alexander. And she was working at the altar with two of the women, and his heart had been praying for years for a wife. And the two of them fell in love and were married. And they began to do work among the people. And one day he said, oh, I just wish we had a way to get the word into people's hands on a daily basis. Like the ones that are going off to war, the soldiers. And Mary thought back to her childhood and her high school days. And she said, I know the way. It's called the Pocket Testament League that God gave to me when I was a little girl. And do you know the Pocket Testament League is still in existence and just celebrated its 100th birthday in 1993? And one of the days in the war, the Second World War, one day they got a million, they gave away a million Bibles. There were that many that came of troopers all around the world asking for the word of God. God wants to work in your life, in our children's lives, in our husband's lives, in our family's lives, to touch a broken, lost, weeping, dying world. And do you know what he needs? He does not need sophisticated Christians who have left God's word. He needs those of us who will bear the reproach of his name and who will sell out to Jesus Christ 150% and then get into the stream of the Spirit and think of a creative way to do it, even if we're a little girl sewing pockets on our clothes so we can hand out the Word of God and lead 60 schoolmates to Jesus. What are we doing for Jesus? Is your life counting? Is it not counting because there's sin there? Is there something we're holding on to we won't let go of? You know what? We'll hold on to it and we will damn our souls. And God is saying, I have begun to give, begin to possess, and let us move on into the promised land and let us preach the word to our children and our children's children and those children yet to be born and stand in the gap and take these memorial stones and the decision you and I make today will affect the thousandth generation if we choose for God. And it goes on and on and on and on. And God is asking today for some crisis women who will have the courage to surrender all. The truth is today, will you do it? Will I do it? It's a fearful thing. It's an awesome thing. Will we step into that Jordan and let the old life die and come out on the other side and put up memorial stones of what Jesus Christ has done to set us free? That's the power and the beauty of it of his gospel for us. Let's pray. 